But hello, and thank you for joining us for the webinar. My name is Dwayne Butcher of Lean Frontiers, and I have the pleasure of serving as your host for the session titled Balance the Seesaw of Process Changes and People. Today's presenter is Dennis Becker, who is a TWI Institute Master Trainer for TWI Job Instruction and TWI Problem Solving. He specializes in rapid operations transformation and optimization using TWI and Toyota Kata coaching techniques to deliver step changes in productivity, quality, cost, and employee motivation with very short project lead times. So for now, but Dennis, I'm gonna go ahead and turn things over to you. Hi, thanks uh, Dwayne, and uh, thanks everybody for uh, tuning in today. Uh, today, I want to share a few things with you that I've learned over the years um, when um, leading small improvement projects and larger lean transformations. When I was heading up um, the global OPEX group of a multinational manufacturer and by working with my clients uh, over the last few years all over the world. Now, um, many change projects heavily uh, are heavily focused on designing organizational structure and uh, processes. Now, people are often a secondary concern. I'm not saying that they're forgotten, but for sure they, uh, we often have um, communication plans and even some training in place. But unfortunately, often that is not quite enough. Um, and the seesaw of people and process transitions is uh, not balanced. And therefore the speed and success of our change in initiative suffers. Now, success of changes fundamentally depends on people. Uh, they are they have a huge impact on our success and the speed and sustainability of our changes. Uh, they determine process performance and stability. And in fact, they're so critical, one could argue that the balance of the seesaw saw should be reversed, um, more, foc more heavily focusing on the people side and perhaps a little bit less so on the technical changes that we want to uh, uh, put in place. Now, we need to ensure that people both have the skill to succeed in the new environment we're creating, as well as the will to put in the extra effort the changes require until they become routine and everyday reality. So, <clears throat> now let me show you a case where the seesaw was out of balance. Um, this is somewhat of an old example, but it was a very high profile one. It was the failure or the, the, the traumatic startup of um, uh, London Heathrow Airport's Terminal 5, where, you know, I'm not going to read all of this out, but basically uh, they had uh, huge issues at the beginning to get all the systems up and running. And some of the most fundamental issues that they experienced were very much related to the skill and the will of the people to actually um, make it happen. So, you know, it's quite typical in, in large projects, um, you know, especially when they're large and complex and you, we have a lot of technical things to consider that timelines slip and completion dates uh, move. But of course, in high profile projects, there's a lot of political pressure. And in the case of Terminal 5, you know, that pressure determined, you know, a very tight timeline. They don't want to let it slip. And so, of course, these delays start impacting some decisions, um, you know, that actually impact overall quality. And um, in the in the case of Terminal 5, um, you know, it had to do with the testing, the training of the people, making sure that everybody knew what they were going, uh, where, where they were going to be, what they had to do, and so on. So fundamentally, you know, they paid a lot of attention to the technical details, but on the people side, something was lack, uh, lacking, seriously lacking, and we had this seesaw of the technical and the people changes uh, totally uh, unbalanced. And now it, it wasn't as if it hadn't been bad enough that, you know, the skill side for the people uh, wasn't, uh, you know, uh, taken care of uh, sufficiently. People were confused where they had to be, um, you know, what they had to do, how to run the systems and so on. Uh, also on the will side, in, in other words, the morale, the motivation of the people, they had serious issues where in the past, you know, British Airways would have had sort of you know, the discretionary effort of the people to put in an extra effort to come in on, on extra days and so on. 
also that was lacking. So, you know, as a result, of course, they had a traumatic uh, startup, you know, Terminal 5 wasn't working. There were hundreds of passengers, if not thousands of passenger, passengers that were stranded, bags were backlogged and so on and so forth. So that's kind of like a high profile example of seesaw out of balance. Um, but you can probably draw the parallels to many of the projects that you guys might have seen um, and, and, and even led in, in your operational lives. Now, another um, you know example, uh, perhaps more of the positive kind here, is you know in in this particular case uh, we're looking at a manufacturing side that faced the challenge of significantly improving their cost position in a very short period of time. Now, order volumes in this kind of environment are highly variable, and orders are customized and made to order, which explains uh, the the month to month variation, productivity variation that you're observing here. But note the jump um, that was achieved, uh, you know, quarter on quarter, you know, from, you know, the, the last quarter of 2015 uh, to the last quarter of um, 2016 here, a 50% productivity increase. Um, so what happened here? Within one year of applying a balanced set of training within the industry skills um, to simul simultaneously manage the process and the people transitions, productivity was actually improved. So, you know, the project leaders here took a very balanced approach and made sure that both the people were motivated, they were properly skilled, they were prepared for the changes uh, that had to be implemented, uh, as well as designing on the process side, on the process engineering side, a very good system that was thought through and tested. And so, you know, they made a very rapid progress, um, you know, in, in, in this kind of environment. So, you know, this is the a, a bad example, a good example. So does this kind of, uh, you know, logic of needing to balance, uh, you know, the process and the people transitions uh, also apply in larger lean transformations? Now, in my experience, the answer is a definite yes, but of course you don't have to take my word for it there's plenty of research evidence to back me up. If you look, for example, at uh, research that was done by uh, the Shingo Institute, um, it, that indicates that a high rate of uh, you know, lean and operations excellence transformations actually fail because they're too heavily tools focused and you know, pay very little attention or too little attention to crucial foundational ingredients such as standard work, the leadership and trust, uh, which are insufficiently emphasized. So there's plenty of evidence that, you know, what applies to smaller or larger projects also applies to larger lean transformations when we're trying to create a new environment, uh, a way of operating our businesses that is fundamentally different. And so this balance of, um, you know, or balancing of the seesaw is crucially important. Now, there's some lean celebrities, of course, that have made appropriate comments uh, in this, um, um, in relation to this as well. So if you take, for example, Jeffrey Leiker, uh, um, the author of uh, the Toyota Way, he remarks that most companies have focused too heavily on tools without understanding lean as entire system that must be uh, must permeate an organization's culture so in other words we're here talking about you know uh, more technical views um, you know or approaches to lean that are insufficiently balanced with again that people transformation the development of the people that have to work and succeed uh, in the system uh, that we're trying to create um, now um, you know, similarly, if you look at, um, you know, um, um, Toyota, the Toyota production system, um, a gentleman called um, Mr. Kato, Isao Kato, he was for many years uh, in charge of the Toyota training organization and, um, you know, was also developing, also developed directly with Taichi owner back in the 1970s, some of the first uh, Toyota production system uh, training manuals. And he again remarks that to su successfully manage people, um, you know, uh, uh, the, the implementation of lean, um, 
you need to emphasize the people development and making the leaders fundamentally capable of uh, delivering these improvements. So in other words, to successfully manage people transformations, um, perhaps the most critical thing that we need to change is the way we lead our people, the way we lead change and the way we help our people adapt to and help us with uh, the necessary changes. So um, obviously, you've um you must have you know if you're a lean person you you will have heard about the toyota phrase making people before we make cars and um you know if the way our leaders uh lead needs to change we need to help our supervisors and our middle managers develop new leadership skills and habits and this is where any lean transformation uh, needs to start uh, effectively with the leadership skills of these people otherwise of course um you know any progress uh, that we make in our lean transformation will be slow and painful. Now, um, previous on a previous slide, it showed you know less lack of balance gives you poor results. On the you know flip side of this, of course, you know we're suggesting that you know if you have balance, you will see good results happening. So when the seesaw of technical transitions and people transitions is rebalanced, uh, we will see better results. Now, how do we do this? How do we manage, uh, rebalance our current approach and find a, a better balancing of technical and uh, engineering transformation with the corresponding uh, people transitions. Um, well, fundamentally, we need to think or we need to look at our process changes from both angles. What journey do we need to make on the process side and what corresponding um, journey do we need on the people side? In effect, it first needs uh, means that we first need to figure out what skills our people need to build um, to build in order to succeed and what habits they need to develop to work success successfully in the kind of process that we want to end up with. Once we understand where they need to be, we then need to establish where they are right now in relation to the desired uh, future state in terms of their skills and habits. Um, this will give us a gap which we then uh, need to close if we want to succeed. Now, in most cases, you will have things like, you know, um, one day lean introduction or awareness courses, a set of slides, maybe a little simulation. Uh, and, um, you know, there will be a, a communication plan in place. But, you know, most likely, in, and in my experience, and, and you will confirm that, you know, if you've ever led a lean uh, a transition, you know, just uh, making people aware of uh, lean and uh, of the changes that need to happen is not enough. More likely, we need to take them by the hand and develop practical hands-on skills and habits in the Gamba, be that on the shop floor, in the office, uh, and help them actually uh, make that transition, make the changes and develop in order to be successful in the new environment. Um, this is much more challenging, of course, um, you know, for lean transformation leaders or, you know, operational leaders and, uh, you know, any uh, deployment champions. But it's definitely good for everybody, uh, everybody in, in terms of their professional development and their growth. And it's essentially for us, if we want our new process changes to stick quickly and to deliver return on investment so for our process capability to grow our people need to grow at the same time and uh, so we need to have a real good plan in place in order to make that happen so let me give you another another example um here's an example of a supervisor that put that kind of thinking into practice she had a significant challenge restructuring her area as her plant underwent what was called a strategic cost reduction initiative uh, which was in a high volume low margin kind of industry to put it simply she was going to lose about 20 percent of her, her highly skilled team whilst having to maintain service levels um, uh, at the same time as the level of demand or uh, placed on her team was uh, pretty flat pr pretty much the same as uh, as before 
Now, losing 20% of her team was a major challenge for her. Um, this clearly re required uh, major process changes to increase productivity and avoid uh, impacting quality and safety. But she also realized that the challenge she faced was much more to do with a people challenge than uh, just a technical one. So she decided to develop separate A3s, you know, A3 um, process, um, you know, um, um, project documents or stories, um, focusing on the one side on, um, you know, pr uh, the process itself and on the other side on the people. So she had separate A3s to make sure that she properly thought through each of these angles as she had it into, you know, managing this major process change in her in her area. Um, now, on the process side, she made a number of significant changes, which included changing shift patterns, redistributing um, responsibilities across shifts, balancing workloads uh, across uh, different weekdays uh, in different patterns. And in addition, um, um, you know, some of the problems uh, that had been masked by previous uh, staffing levels became more visible as team members started to depart. So she had quite some, uh, you know, significant challenge on that, uh, you know, process side. On the people side then, she had to deal with a demoralized team, obviously, because, you know, losing that amount of uh, team members, uh, you know, put a lot of pressure on the team. Uh, a significant skills gap um, left by the departure of highly qualified team members and tensions which started to emerge between individuals and different roles within the team. In other words, she developed a balanced role map here to um, looking at the challenge from both angles, the process and the people angle. And this kept her focused on what needed to be done on both sides, things and people, and ultimately helped her in managing a successful transition with her team. Uh, and that was successful for her plant and last but not least for herself as well. So, you know, in, through this more balanced approach that she took, um, you know, to what we call, you know, the seesaw um, between process and people here. She grew her reputation in the plant and uh, she actually, last time I talked to the plant manager, you know, um, was um, one of the uh, people that was uh, identified as a high caliber um, uh, person for promotion. So um, this is the kind of, you know, practical application of, uh, you know, balancing the seesaw that I was uh, talking to, uh, talking about earlier. Now, um, moving on, <clears throat> you know, if we take, uh, you know, another example, um, you know, very close to, you know, what what many of you as, as lean um, transformation agents have to, you know, pay attention to um, is, you know, the, the question of standardization. Standardization is, of course, a big deal for successful lean transformation, and most companies really struggle with getting operators to truly apply standard work methods consistently. Now, there are different ch challenges here. First, we have to figure out what the best methods uh, of doing the job are. Uh, we then have to be, have to be able to pass it on to everybody doing the job and then we have to ensure that it's consistently applied by all not to be uh, not uh, not to speak of continuously improving the standard and going through the whole process again and again and again so standardization is quite a significant challenge now in in twi we have a you know a, a little bit of a motto that comes from the job relations side you know, if, if we approach, um, you know, the this kind of challenge from from a, a balanced perspective, we uh, we say that a supervisor gets results through people who do what needs to be done, when it needs to be done, and the way it needs to be done because they want to do it. So when we're trying to implement standardization, we got to make sure that we've got a good handle on the technical needs and also on the people needs to be able to pull it off. We have the things in place, we have the skill in place and the people uh, you know, also have the will to support us uh, through the journey, making the transition and you know, um, implementing a new process. So how can we apply you know, the, the kind of seesaw thinking uh, to, to a challenge uh, such as this, you know, implementing um, standardization in a, in a manufacturing plant or even just in an area. What kind of skills are required 
of our people. So, you know, when we look at the supervisor skills and habits, we can take, uh, you know, the TWI five needs model um, as a, as a, you know, as a framework to uh, try to think it through. So what kind of skills would a supervisor need in order to successfully implement standardization? Now, the five needs are the skill in instructing, the skill in improving methods, the skill in leading, and then, you know, a handle, um, you know, the, the knowledge, as we say, of the work and the knowledge of responsibilities. So as you can see here, you know, this is not, uh, you know, the, the whole truth perhaps or a complete uh, set of skills that a supervisor would need but it's just an idea of how we could apply it so on the skill of instructing uh, um, of instructing uh, you would find things like you know uh, the supervisor needs to be able to train people to the new standard or the supervisor needs to be able to confirm the standard work uh, once it goes in place on the improving the method side the supervisor will need to be able to solve problems and to improve the process on the leadership side you know the motivational side of, of leading the people the supervisor would need to be able to build trust and cooperation to develop uh, discipline with the people on the side of responsibilities the supervisor would need to be you know making a journey that helps them to balance you know the previous and quite often supervisors are highly focused on making production happen but uh, you know are not focusing perhaps enough on you know leading process improvement in the area so that's another element of the supervisor transition that would need to happen you know that skill development the supervisor themselves need to go through in order to make you know standardization happen and then on the work side of course the supervisor will need to be able to do the standard work required of his or her team because if they don't understand the work well enough then they're not going to be able to either instruct them or even challenge them or improve the process so you know looking at this from a holistic point of view this kind of describes the sort of future state if you want uh, you know the target a condition that a supervisor would need to have in terms of uh, his or her own skill in order to be uh, succeeding in, in an environment where we have, um, uh, you know, um, standardization actually succeed. So, um, you know, um, going forward with, um, you know, this kind of idea. So what kind of supervisor training what we need in, in in order to prepare our supervisors for this kind of transition for managing uh, in implementation of standardization now you know uh, obviously um, twi training within industry might not be you know uh, covering all of the individual skills that a supervisor will need in order to succeed but it's a good starting point and you know just like uh, at toyota since 1952 twi gives us a good strong starting point to develop those skills that a supervisor needs to uh, you know have in place and practice on a daily basis in order to um, you know uh, be successful with things like standardization or lean implementation uh, in their area so you can see here that you know it's basically Basically, you know, mapping uh, the TWI training programs onto onto those skills on the right hand side of the five needs model. We have job instruction, you know, job methods and job relations as foundation training programs. And then, of course, you know, if we are managing a real lean transformation, we would probably have to identify a few additional training programs uh, that we need to put in place in order to grow the skills of our first line leaders and prepare them. Um, for making that transition and managing in this new environment in uh, in a successful way and help us effectively you know make that transition and get results so you know that's just you know, sort of uh, you know thinking through a practical app application of um, um you know this seesaw thinking um as we are going through a lean transformation now you know, as we're then starting to think of, you know, um, once we identify where need, uh, where our people need to be, our leaders need to be in order to be successful in the future, then of course we can start thinking about 
managing that transition or flashing it out a little bit more in, 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 in detail. So, you know, we've already talked about skills. In other words, what do our people need to be able to do in order to, to succeed in the future? Uh, you know, then we're starting to think about routines. In other words, you know, once I've got a skill, then of course that skill needs to be applied regularly. So the question is, what do our people need to be doing and how often do they need to be doing uh, whatever they need to be doing in order to manage that process in the future? And through those routines, when they're happening, you know, on a regular basis and uh, repetitively, perhaps even on a daily basis, ideally, then of course we will start to influence culture because you know there will be new ways that we are actually uh, managing our process um and you know that will effectively from from the outside look like the way we do things um uh, in our plant you know and that's of course one of the classical definitions of of culture the way we do things around here so you know by building the skills and the routines we're starting to build automatically the culture in the plant we're changing the way that our processes operate and our people behave on a daily basis and from there we can of course expect an impact so you know the the lining up of skills routine culture and impact is actually quite deliberate here because you know if you're managing that transition for the people we got to think of this as you know a, a journey that people and the plant have to make and we kind of need to design that transition and accompany our people through that transition in order to uh, get a get a result and to be successful with our lean transition and um, you know and then you know at the bottom i put here uh, you know this old lean motto you know you can't think your way through a new way of acting but you can act your way to a new way of thinking in other words you know by helping all people do uh, doing new things and 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 doing things in a new way of course we can then start to influence um you know their skills development and and the way that our process actually operates also from a management perspective so going back to something that i said earlier just delivering a training or just delivering a set of slides or doing a simulation it's just not enough as lean leaders as transformation uh, specialists or, or you know as leaders uh, operations leaders in the plant we need to think through this entire journey um, how do we actually manage that people transition with our people how do we take them by the hand and lead them in a practical way to um, you know to to be successful um, in the future and to be able to support us correctly you know in in, in making that change in other words in, uh, you know again rebalancing not just thinking about the technical changes the visual management which is great uh, you know the the uh, the layout that we're implementing but actually actively thinking what will that require in terms of skill and the will of the people um now obviously you know i've, I've just taken the example of a supervisor here but those kind of transitions um, that we need to manage exist at different organizational levels. The starting point or the current, um, you know, uh, current state or the, or the actual position of where our people are here indicated in red, uh, not because they're necessarily bad, but just to show the difference here. So the current uh, state and the future state need to be clearly understood. Where do we need our people to be? What's the gap? between where we are right now and where do they need to be in the future? How does that apply to the operator, to the supervisor and to the manager? And then how does that apply to each of the individuals inside of each of these groups? So, you know, obviously, you know, each operator, each supervisor and each manager will have different strengths and weaknesses, I guess, you know, in terms of their current skill set different gaps, personal gaps. And based on that, we can then develop, um, you know, personal development plans. And we can actually help each individual make that transition uh, to be successful in the new environment. So that's kind of the idea of, um, you know, rebalancing the seesaw between physical or process changes and people changes. And, um, and and how it would be applied you know perhaps to the context of a of a lean transformation
in other words, what we've been doing so far, quite often, um, you know, in lean transformation on the people side is probably not enough. We need to make much more of an effort. And just like that supervisor that was managing that 20% reduction in headcount in her department, really, you know, start assessing much more clearly, um, you know, the uh, perhaps the people A3 and the technical A3 and how they actually interplay uh, together to uh, give us a chance uh, to have a good result uh, much faster than we have achieved so far. So let me thank you for um, 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 you know listening to this uh, seminar and uh, you know taking the time to uh, to think about this. Uh, please do get in contact. Um, you know if if you want to discuss um, any of these um, points in more detail you want to exchange some ideas and you know good luck with your uh, lean transformations and with rebalancing uh, the seesaw of uh, technical and process changes well dennis uh thank you very much for not only sharing with us uh here today but just thanks for your thought leadership in the areas of twi toyota kata and and lean business management um Matter of fact, Dennis, if, if people would like to meet you, uh, they can do so uh, if they were to attend the annual TWI and Kata Summit Europe, which you have been a, a part of for the last several years. Um, for upcoming dates and locations for the TWI and Kata Summit Europe, you can visit leanfrontiers.com slash summits, and you'll find the information there. So thanks again, Dennis, and thanks to everyone for participating with us today. Have a great day. Thank you.